Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. So yeah, thanks, thanks, Abby. Thanks, Docfest, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so I'm Adam, director of Data Loku. Uh, a little bit about what Loku does. Uh, we are uh, striving to be local merchants' best friends, and we do this by helping local merchants manage their presence on the web. Uh, so we have wonderful partners like TripAdvisor, uh, City Search, Open Table, Yelp, and Foursquare. Uh, and we power menus and business listings on those sites. So if you've ever gone to Open Table to book a seat at a restaurant and clicked on the menu tab, you'll see Powered by Loku at the bottom. Uh, and this is one way in which we help local merchants kind of keep their presence up to date everywhere on the web. Uh, in doing this, we've learned sort of what, what many local merchants, and in the case of restaurants, what almost all restaurants in the United States, and increasingly all over the web, charge for their products and for their services. And we do this through a pretty deep technology workflow. So this is a cartoon version of what we do. Uh, let's take, for example, a restaurant uh, that a restaurant owner that posts their menu on the web. Uh, we also extract information from any local merchant, so a yoga studio that has their services list up on the web, uh, a nail salon that has their list of services, and the, the largest group of local merchants that we provide services for are restaurants. So you're a local merchant, you put your uh, menu up on the web, and you've probably done this by paying uh, a web designer a few thousand dollars to make a flash animation for you, or to <laughs> embed your menu in a PDF. Maybe you've got a little lower tech, you take, you take your camera phone, you take a picture of the menu, of your paper menu, and you throw it up on your website, which is great as long as you keep that menu up to date, and it's also great if you're not interested in any search engine ever indexing the content in that menu. So what Loku does is crawls the web, finds anything that looks like a local merchant's price list or service list, and we have a set of automated machine learning algorithms that help us extract content from it. So take the example of a PDF. We might OCR it, so extract all the text from that menu. Uh, we have a bunch of classifiers that say things like, well, this looks like a dollar sign and a number. That's probably a price. To the left of it, I see some uh, a snippet of text. That's probably a menu item. To the below the, the menu item and the price, I see a longer bit of text. In the past, that's been a menu item description. And all these things kind of I, I can do some template extraction and say, well, this this one this one template of a menu item is actually repeated a bunch of times, so this is probably a section in a menu. This menu is called breakfast, and I've also extracted the lunch, dinner, and Valentine's Day menu at the same time. And given how diverse the different formats of data are on the web, you, because you've got flash animations and PDFs and images in the mix, in addition to HTML tables, the automated <coughs> algorithms that do the extraction aren't going to do a perfect job. So we also have a few hundred folks all over the web called crowd workers who are helping us get the data to very close to 100% data quality. So they're essentially cleaning up the data and structuring it in a way so that we can figure out what every merchant charges for a product or a service. And as I mentioned, at least for restaurants, we're getting very close to knowing what the price list of every merchant is in the United States and increasingly around the world. So this, this all sounds like it works perfectly, but we have humans in the loop at the end of our workflow, and so that means that we end up with really interesting scenarios like these. When, when I started at Loku, we had this analytics page that told us how many tasks we're processing on any given day, and it looked like this, right? So the, the y-axis here is how many tasks we've completed, the x-axis is the time any given day, and I think, I think uh, our CEO and CTO would probably kill me if I told you what the order of magnitude of the y-axis is, but it's you know, in, the, in the thousands or tens of thousands of, uh, of menus that we're processing each day. The important thing here is that I took a look at this chart and noticed that it's very close to zero on some days. And so computer scientist to me thinks some machine went down there's some bug in our system. There was a day where we processed almost zero menus on the web. 
And it turns out that this happens to us every week. It's called the weekend. So just like you, just like me, we do a little bit less work on weekends than we do during the week. And when we started off, we had a crowd that essentially looked like this. They would do a lot of work during the week, they'd take the weekend off, and we wouldn't be able to process enough tasks. So this is the kind of thing that we had to design around to make sure that we have uh, crowd workers available to process a merchant's data when they upload it on the weekend, for example. And so as you think about working with humans in the loop, start thinking about the kinds of things that you have to design for, given that they're human beings. A little bit of a picture of what Loku looks like right now um, in terms of employment. So we're an MIT startup. We did the traditional thing that as soon as you get money, uh, you end up moving to San Francisco. So here you see there's about 20 of us in the Loku San Francisco office. There's about five of us working in the Cambridge office. And the Cambridge office is here to stay. Don't worry, it's actually growing. Uh, but that's, that's 25 of us. That's a, a, a reasonable sized startup, but it doesn't exactly compare to the few hundred crowd workers that we have elsewhere in the world. So specifically in places like the Philippines, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, we have hundreds of crowd workers that we pay to help us structure our data. And so with that, the rest of this talk is essentially going to be about those human beings that are, that are doing awesome work for us. And before we can actually get into it, I just want to define a few terms that you might hear me talking about throughout the talk. The first is human computation. And this is one that maybe you haven't heard of before. Uh, essentially, human computation is when you have people that help computers perform some tasks that the people are just better suited to do. And there's a number of flavors of this. There's a number of flavors of this. So there, there are certain machine learning algorithms, so things like computer vision, where in order to do generic object detection, so I take a picture of something in the world, I might take it from a strange angle, I might take it with improper lighting. We haven't yet gotten machine learning algorithms that can do generic object recognition on any object in the world with really high accuracy. But a human can do a really good job of it. They can tell you that this is a building, and this is a tree, and that this is adult content, for example. So humans are really good at doing this kind of generic object detection. And you might need to seek out human computation to do a really good job of doing computer-aided machine vision. That's a task where the machines aren't so good and the humans are really good. There's other kinds of things, like training spam detectors. So your, your mailbox, your, your mail client, is probably pretty good at filtering out emails that contain spam in them. In fact, your, at most of the web clients that you use for email are probably filtering out the majority of the spam that you receive with pretty high accuracy. But still, every once in a while, they'll make a mistake, and you hit the spam button. And when you're doing that, you're contributing one small amount of human computation to the system to train the algorithm. So that's human computation. Crowdsourcing is a way of getting a source of people that can assist you with human computation. So this source can be pretty varied. I'm going to talk to you about a source of people that you pay in order to do work, but there's a number of other ones. So one of my favorite examples is a few years ago, The Guardian, a British newspaper, collected a few hundred thousand PDFs that contained Minister of Parliament expense reports. And those things contain pretty interesting bits of information in them, but they didn't have the workforce inside the Guardian to process all of that information. So they made a really nice web application that kind of turned it into a game for you to help find some embarrassing expenses that your Minister of Parliament uh, filed in a report. And within a few days slash a few weeks to actually finish everything, they crunched through the whole data set for free with the help of their readership. Uh, Wikipedia is another great example of a crowdsourcing effort. We all probably use it at this point. Um, there's essentially people who want to contribute information to the world on some small amount of a topic that they understand really well. And it's amazing just how much information we can collect this way. And the last one, you might say, actually, th th this, this is a great way for me to waste my time rather than to spend it well contributing to the world. But Reddit is actually a, a great source of what you should read next. And 
It's done by asking human beings to contribute a really small bit of information, either a link or maybe an upvote or a downvote on, an, on a link that someone else has found. And with that bit of information, they can surface kind of the front page of, of the web. It's also subtly a really good example of how crowdsourcing can go wrong. So I, it, it's kind of sad to have to bring this up, but a great example of Reddit trying to crowdsource an effort is something we saw a few months ago during the Boston bombings, right? So Reddit, a, a small subreddit, a community of people got together and said, well, let's, ha let's filter through all the images that people have surfaced on, on the web uh, and try to find the bombers. And because of a, a set of misaligned incentives, because of the wrong set of instructions, because there was no one that was kind of steering folks in the right direction, we ended up finding a bomber that actually turned out not to be the bomber. And so it, this is a really good example of how crowdsourcing isn't magic. You actually have to design a system that works well with the human beings that you're trying to solve a problem. The type of crowdsourcing that I'm going to be talking to you about today is paid crowdsourcing. So rather than getting a bunch of people to do things uh, out of the sheer goodness of their heart or because they're super interested in something, you pay them in order to do the task. And one of the most famous crowdsourcing marketplaces is Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And on Mechanical Turk, there's hundreds of thousands of people all over the web called Turkers who are willing to do small tasks called hits or human intelligence tasks in exchange for small amounts of money. So you might ask someone to label an image for you or to create a short snippet of text for you or to correct a short snippet of text for you, clean up a data set for you, things like that, in exchange for anywhere from a penny to a few dollars for a small, well-contained task. Mechanical Turk isn't the only one. There's a number of other uh, crowdsourcing marketplaces. One of them over here that you see, Odesk, in 2012, a billion dollars exchanged hands between people who wanted tasks done on their behalf and people who were willing to do it. And this is up from, I think, 225 billion in 2011. So this is, this is growing pretty quickly. The last thing that I'd like to define is this notion of remote labor, right? So by, by participating in a crowdsourced marketplace, you're essentially saying, I want to pay some money to work with someone who is in some way not as close to you as, as, as you could be. And close can be defined in a number of ways, right? People might be geographically distant from you. They might have cultural differences from you that have them understand information differently than you. Or maybe even emotionally or professionally, they just have a different set of incentives. And so these are the humans that we want to design well around. And so with that kind of a long intro, the three topics that I'm going to be talking to you about today are two different models for doing crowdsourcing. The microtask model, which is kind of the most popular model, a hierarchical model, which is one that we increasingly are using at Loku, and then I want to leave it off by talking about the humans that power these systems. So let's start with microtasks. The, there's a bunch of different microtask completion uh, frameworks that you can use. Two marketplaces that facilitate these kinds of microtasks are Amazon's Mechanical Turk. I already talked about it. There's these Turkers that do hits on your behalf in exchange for small amounts of money. And there's also folks like Crowdflower that say, hey, it's actually kind of difficult to figure out who the good workers on Mechanical Turk are. And it's kind of difficult to figure out whether they made a mistake or not. So they provide you with an API to set up your crowdsource workflows wrapped around marketplaces like Mechanical Turk. And the idea behind a microtask is that you want to ask a really small, well-contained question that has a pretty well-defined answer. So this is everything from you know, filtering out bad content to identifying a single word that labels an image to a problem that we handle all the time at Logu. Uh, and and that is of entity disambiguation. So if, are people OK seeing this? I just want to make sure that it's not blocked too much. Um, essentially, we, we run into this, this problem all the time. So Loku has a bunch of business listings, essentially the name, the address, the phone number, other contact information for a bunch of businesses. And we also have price lists or service lists for those venues. 
And our friends at TripAdvisor or Foursquare will come to us and they'll say, hey, I've got my own set of business listings. I want you to provide me with a menu for each of these businesses. Well, their listings and our listings might look slightly different from one another, and you might end up with these really difficult cases to decide, right? So if anyone knows Inman Square well, you'll probably remember that there was a place called Aram's Number One Pizza and Subs. It closed down. Uh, and to, to, the, to the right, you'll see All Star Pizza Bar, which is the pizzeria that opened up in its place. So they have the same address, a slightly different phone number. They're, they both have pizza in the name. And as a human being, you can look at these and say, yeah, of course, Aram's number one pizza house is not the same place as All Star Pizza, pizza Bar. But a machine learning algorithm might think that they're actually pretty similar. And so a nice micro task is to show these two listings to a crowd worker and say, hey, just let me know, yes or no, are these two businesses the same or not? And if it were that easy, if asking someone, are these two businesses the same, and they click yes or they click no, then this talk would be over. <laughs> but there's actually a problem here, which is that humans make mistakes. Humans give you the wrong answer. They, maybe you asked the question incorrectly. Maybe you didn't give them enough instructions to ha on how to define venues being the same. Maybe you weren't paying them enough, and they were just running through all of your questions and making mistakes along the way. Or maybe they were even being malicious. Uh, or there, there's this really good anecdote that those of us in the crowdsourcing uh, world like to tell, and the number changes each time we tell it. So I've heard it differently in, in different ways, and the experiments that I've run, it's been different each time. But you, you go on Mechanical Turk, you ask 100 crowd workers to flip a coin and tell you whether it's heads or tails. And if the crowd is fair, and if the coin is fair, then you're likely going to get about 50 heads and about 50 tails. But if you ask this question on Mechanical Turk, you'll get anywhere between 70 and 80 heads. So either there are really biased coins all over the web, or people might not exactly be giving you the right answer. Because it's a lot easier to just type H and move on with your life than to actually find a coin around the house, flip it, and do all this work to type it in in exchange for the five cents that someone's offering you. So now we have a problem, which is we don't actually know whether the answers we're getting from the crowd are correct, but there's actually a pretty easy solution to this. It's voting. So don't ask just one person each question. Ask multiple people the question. So this micro-task verification uh, workflow that I'm telling you about essentially says, yeah, I want to know about whether Aram's number one pizza and subs is the same as All Star Pizza Bar. I'm going to ask this yes or no question, and I'm going to ask it of five people same time. And so five people will give me responses. Let's say that four of them tell me, no, these are not the same venue. One of them says yes, maybe by accident, maybe maliciously. I can do something simple, like take the majority vote. There's four no's, there's one yes. So no, these are not the same business listing. And this actually helps us filter out a good amount of the wrong answers. So just some math behind this. It's not the case that you're going to hit a 30% incorrect uh, rate on Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk has actually some great workers on it. But let's take the extreme, right? Every time you ask a worker a question, 30% thir thir of the responses you get are going to be incorrect. So let's say we do this five worker majority vote trick. And here's, here's a little bit of math. You, you might have to whip out your, your high school or college, or maybe you didn't take a probability class. Uh, but we want to know how likely it is that if we ask five people this question and 30% of the time they might give us the wrong answer, we're going to be wrong. Well, the probability of being wrong is the probability that three people told us, yes, those two venues are the same, or four people told us that they're the same, or five people told us that they're the same. And if you make some of those independence <coughs> assumptions that you might remember from that class you took, you can multiply a bunch of probabilities together and you end up with 2%. So by asking five people, some of, some of which might give us a 30% incorrect response rate, uh, we can actually, with a simple majority vote, get down to a 2% incorrect rate, which is actually pretty awesome. That's, now we're starting to get to a, to a place where we can actually do something meaningful with the work. And it turns out that majority vote actually leaves a lot of information on the table, because 
you can start determining when a worker is frequently agreeing with or disagreeing with the crowd. And after time, you can say, well, this worker seems to always be in the minority. Maybe I'm just not going to ask them as many of these questions. And I'll ask the workers who are agreeing with the crowd frequently to answer questions. And that's actually something that you don't have to reinvent for yourself. There's some wonderful folks who have already done this. They wrote a paper called Quality Management on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. You can read it. It's pretty awesome. More importantly, you should probably follow some of them on Twitter. Uh, the first one, Panos, is, is sort of the godfather of usable crowdsourcing tools. Uh, and luckily, they put all of, this, all of the software behind uh, this paper into a tool called Get Another Label. So don't implement majority vote. Don't implement your own complicated algorithms. Just go on GitHub and, and get their code. Just last night, they released something called Project Troya, which is even better than this one. I'd be happy to talk to you about it more at the end. And so, great. We can ask redundant questions of our workers, and we can figure out which of them is not giving us the right answer. It turns out that if we're the platform, if we're Mechanical Turk, for example, then we don't just know that one set of questions that, uh, that we asked about venues being the same. We know how, how workers answer every single question that's in the system. And so there's two examples of, of the platforms actually learning how good workers are. One of them is Amazon Mechanical Turk's master's program. Essentially what you do is pay each worker in the master's program. Essentially it's a, it's a certified worker. Mechanical Turk tells you, hey, this worker has done really good work in the past. Give them, you know, 20% premium on, on the price and ask a lot less workers because you know that this is a trusted set of workers. So ask the masters, don't ask as many redundant questions and you'll actually save money. Crowdflower employs a similar idea. So Crowdflower makes it easier for you to crowdsource your questions and therefore they've seen a bunch of workers do a bunch of work on, on a varied set of problems. So similarly, they can help point you at the workers that are doing best in exchange for a small premium on your tasks. Again, so far, all I've told you about is how to spend money on the crowd to have them do work for you, but there's actually a, something that you can do that's even better. So micro tasks have really well-defined inputs and really well-defined outputs. That sounds a lot like machine learning algorithms like classifiers or regressions. And so you can help get information from the crowd in our case, uh, we, can, we can show a few thousand, a few tens of thousands of venue pairs to the crowd workers, have them tell us whether this venue is the same as that venue or not, uh, and extract a bunch of features from the listings, like whether the names match, whether the names match with a few letters flipped, uh, other features from the address and the phone number, et cetera, and train a machine learning algorithm that can help classify future business listings as being the same or not. And it turns out that this isn't just a game or a trick. Our venue matching algorithm, after being trained with a few tens of thousands of examples from the crowd, now has higher accuracy than the crowd. So it can tell us when it's not certain of, the, of, of a match, and we'll still go to the crowd workers to help us disambiguate the really hard cases but we're saving significant amount, of, significant amount of money now by going to algorithms to help us do our matching rather than going to the crowd to ask the simple matching questions. And so the summary of this micro task section is that you should be asking really short, simple questions of your crowd workers. There shouldn't be too many ambiguities. You, wanna, you don't know that any one worker is going to give you a good response, and so you wanna ask your questions redundantly of multiple workers, and you should use this heuristic that prior quality predicts the future quality. So if, if a worker has done well in the past, you should go to them with more work. That's sort of the positive view on microtask, right? You can take a cynical view of this description of microtasks and say, well, actually, if you're asking really short, simple questions, you're kind of being dehumanizing, right? You're, you're basically asking people to do the simplest possible thing, even an idiot can't get it wrong. You're asking questions redundantly because essentially you don't trust the crowd. And you're essentially saying that any worker that's doing a good job is going to be rewarded by getting more of the same simple task 
you're essentially giving them more uninspiring work. And so the micro-task world works really well in certain scenarios, but it's not exactly the world that, that you or I would want to be living in if we're doing work. So that leads us to another way to organize our crowds, and it's, it's a hierarchical crowdsourcing model. It's one that a, a number of companies are using, although it's a, it's a smaller number of companies. So two companies that use it, for example, are us, Loku, and our good friends at MobileWorks. Um, MobileWorks is another startup uh, in Berkeley, California. They run kind of a, a, a more generic crowdsourcing platform, and they organize their workers into hierarchies. The good workers are training the entry-level workers. They make sure that when a worker makes a mistake, they kind of correct that worker. And in general, they can start trusting their workers to do higher level tasks. And the thing that you need in order to facilitate this hierarchical crowdsourcing model that I'll dive into more detail on in a bit is some source of long-term relationships with your crowd workers. So at Loku, one of the places where we establish these long-term relationships is on Odesk. Specifically for our data entry tasks, for typing up menus and things like that, we can go to Odesk and have access to several hundreds of thousands of workers who are looking for data entry jobs. And the idea is through Odesk, we can establish a longer term relationship with crowd workers. Uh, we can give them higher order tasks. Hey, process this entire venue's worth of content and, and let us know kind of what they serve for dinner. And rather than asking multiple workers the same question, we'll instead just keep track of how the workers are doing and promote them into more interesting positions as they do well. So I'll give you a really concrete example of how this works now. And the, thing, the first thing to understand is sort of how a micro task is fundamentally different from a higher order task. So let's look at an example from, from local. We are processing all price lists in all sorts of formats uh, all over the web and increasingly offline. So here's a dinner menu. It was in a PDF that I took a screenshot of. And it's got you know, two sections to start and big plates. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this PDF alone is probably not really well indexed by Google or Bing, right? So we wanna extract all of the structured information from this menu and convert it into something that looks like this. So our algorithms do a best effort to identify that this is a dinner menu, that there's a section called to start, and then extract all of the menu items there. And if you've ever seen something like Markdown or Wikitext, this looks a lot like those. Essentially, we're having our algorithms and our workers type things up in a structured format where you know one equal sign uh, signifies a, a menu, two equal signs signify a section, and then you can type up a menu item, a description underneath it, and a price. So workers are working at this scale. We have one worker, we tell them, hey, give us all of the structured information from a single venue. For a restaurant that's, as I said before, it's going to be a breakfast, lunch, dinner menu, Valentine's Day menu, Father's Day menu, all the different menus that you can find on this merchant site. And so at the end of that process, a worker is going to have generated a significant amount of text, a significant amount of structured data, and they might have spent an hour doing it. If we were to go the micro-task model, we then have another worker type up the same amount of work, spend another hour, we pay both of them, and then we'd have two bits of text that are different by some punctuation, by some capitalization, and we'd have no idea how to rectify the situation. We just have two bits of kind of uncomfortable text. So instead what we do is employ workers in this hierarchy. And this hierarchy is going to grow on this slide. So essentially, we hire a worker off of Odesk, and we start them off as a data entry specialist. So we tell the data entry specialist, hey, you're going to see uh, a semi-completed menu that's coming out of our, our algorithms. And it might have some mistakes in it. It might be missing some content. Just type things up, fix the structure, get things looking good. Uh, we offer them training guides on how to do this. We offer them quizzes to make sure that they're doing a good job and that they understand the concepts. Uh, and, and in general, we give them a bunch of different directions to get them to the level that we need them at. But this worker just came off of Odesk, and we don't really know how good of a job they're going to do, and we don't know what kinds of mistakes they're going to make. So when we start off, 
all of this data entry specialist's work is going to be reviewed by a reviewer. So some reviewer who's essentially a, a, another crowd worker who has proven themselves, who has done great work in the past and a lot of it in the past, they're going to look at the work that this data entry specialist did and they'll say, hey, it looks like you, you missed the Valentine's Day menu, so why don't you go back and, and type that up? And the, the worker will go type it up. Then the, the, the reviewer will say, hey, it looks like you don't quite understand on the pizza menu how to do choices and additions. You know, how, how do you add, how do you, what's our syntax for typing up that you can add pepperoni and chicken and broccoli to this pizza? So why don't you go read this documentation that explains our syntax for doing that? And then the work, the data entry specialist will edit that, send it back to the reviewer, and the reviewer will notice that there's one punctuation mistake, they'll just fix it themselves and submit the task. And it turns out that a data entry specialist takes a bit longer than a reviewer to do the task, so we actually have reviewers read multiple workers' work and give them feedback on it and train them as they go. We want reviewers to grow as well, so every once in a while we'll send a reviewer's task to another reviewer, and this way everyone is constantly learning and, and we have a sense of how everyone's doing in the system. <coughs> Teaching people based on examples from one-off tasks and one-off mistakes that they made is good, it gets us really far, but there's some cross-cutting issues that you can get to, if, that you can correct, if you look at multiple tasks that a worker did. So we also take our, our really, really good and trusted reviewers and promote them to manager status. And the manager's job is, is a bit more multifaceted. They get to look at the last 20 tasks a worker did, and they look through them and they say, oh, it looks like you really still don't understand choice syntax. Here, go read this documentation. I've generated some quiz questions for you to take. Let's just make sure that you understand this before you keep going. And so the manager's job is actually to create new content, to create documentation, to create examples, and to figure out where things are going wrong. There's a bit of incentivizing going on here as well. We want to make sure that data entry specialists kind of get up to speed and process data quickly. So we pay the data entry specialist uh, per task, right? So for every task that you complete, depending on the difficulty of the task, we'll pay you. Uh, for reviewers, we want to make sure that they take their time if there's a task that really needs a lot of work and a worker that really needs a lot of work, then we want the reviewer to take more time with that task, and so we pay them by the hour. And similarly, managers, that's a promotion, so we pay them more per hour. And as workers do better, we can, we can incentivize them from a monetary perspective by offering them more money, in addition to a number of other things. So this idea of incentives is super important. I'll give you an example of how we optimize for quality, which is sort of the number one thing that Loku needs to, to optimize for, because essentially we don't want to have an embarrassing situation where a worker types something up, it's super incorrect, and it appears on one of our data partners' websites. So let's say that we've reviewed a bunch of, uh, reviewers have looked at a bunch of tasks that a data entry specialist has done. We see that the amount of reviews over time is getting smaller and smaller. This worker is getting corrected less and less. Their quality is essentially increasing. And the act of having a reviewer look at their work is hitting diminishing returns. So essentially, their quality is going up. We can increase the amount of money that the data entry specialist makes, so give them a bonus. We can start decreasing the rate at which we review the worker. And actually, we can determine, we, we have uh, a regression at this point that one of our interns, Daniel, has worked on that can predict based on the amount, based on various uh, features that we extract from the task when a data entry specialist completes it, what score a reviewer would have given it. And it's actually getting very, very accurate at this point. So we know ahead of time what, a review, what score a reviewer would give this task. And given that, we can have reviewers triage the tasks that need the most love. And in exchange, we don't have to review every single task, and we don't have to review every part of every single task. So now we're pushing closer to having one worker do one task and not having to have any redundancy in the system for our best workers. And finally, if a worker is doing an amazing job or consistently, we can promote them into reviewer status or the manager status. Not everyone does a great job, so if a worker's quality starts going down, the first thing we do is bump up their review rate. The last thing we want is our, for our data quality to be dropping. We also start increasing the amount of training that they get. 
And this is something that I don't want to pretend is magic, and I don't want to pretend that we have solved as a problem. It's actually very hard to look at a set of tasks that someone's done and say, hey, systematically, here is what you're doing wrong, and here's how to improve on it. So we have smart managers. They do a great job. We look at some of the tasks and try to identify content that we can generate and training materials that we can generate. But this is definitely an active area of work that, that, we're, that we're always looking into making better. And finally, a really interesting uh, incentive mechanism that's been doing an amazing job of improving our data quality is if a worker is consistently doing bad work, we don't have to fire them. We don't have to end their contract. We'll just start giving them less and less work. So if you did a really bad job last week, next week, we just won't have as many tasks available for you to do. And very quickly, workers either decide that they want to work on something else with a different company, or they, they decide that they really need to get more experience and improve on what they're doing. So that's, this is just one example of how we incentivize high quality. There's a number of other incentive mechanisms in place, and I'd be happy to talk to you about them uh, after this. In short, hierarchical uh, crowdsourcing is all about establishing long-term relationships with your crowd workers, about having them complete high-order tasks. So don't give them really small, demeaning things. Trust them to do good work, but verify that they're doing a good job on it. We also offer the workers upward mobility. So we say, hey, you can be promoted two times. You can increase the amount of money that you get paid if you do a good job. And finally, when workers need some help, we train and incentivize them rather than just saying, hey, you can't do work for us anymore. And so you might think that I'm pretty biased, that I want to live in a world where we're doing hierarchical crowdsourcing and we're never doing microtasks. And that's not quite the case. Yes, it's the world I want to live in. In fact, it's the world that I do live in. Loku is not a hierarchical company. It's not like people are coming from the top down and telling me how to, how to live my life. But it is the case that we have more experienced people, and they mentor the, the entry-level folks that come into the company and need a bit more attention. Uh, it's the case that we have upward mobility at Loku, just like all the companies that, that everyone here works for. And so this is the world that I'd like to be designing for the crowd as well. But it's not the case that every task is, can be made into a macro task. Some tasks are just micro tasks. So, this venue, uh, th this, this venue matching problem that I described to you, it's a simple yes, no question that you so show someone two business listings for. There, it's, you'd have to try really hard to turn that into a macro, into a large task. So that task remains a micro task that we send off to Crowdflower. There's some jobs that are just short term. So this was especially the case for me as a grad student when I was doing research on the Mechanical Turk. I would want to run an experiment I'd send off a survey to Mechanical Turk, or I'd send off a set of tasks to Mechanical Turk. A few hundred or a few thousand workers would do them, and then I'd be done. Or maybe I just want to train a machine learning algorithm that will do a good enough job for me. And so there isn't some long-term relationship that I can establish with the workers, and I should stick to a micro-task framework. And finally, micro-task frameworks and, and, and uh, marketplaces aren't all that bad. Uh, the Amazon Mechanical Turk Masters program is a great example of how you can find many trusty workers on a lot of these microtask platforms, and there's no reason not to be using them. So now I've told you about kind of the, the two most prominent ways in which we can organize crowd workers. And what I want to leave us off with is some, are a few thoughts about the crowd workers themselves to really understand the humans that are powering these systems. And it's as, as one of the people who helps manage the systems that, that help our crowd workers get work done, it's really easy for me to think like a computer scientist and to abstract away the fact that there's humans doing work. Uh, one of the other employees at Loku, Matt, whose job it is essentially to interact with the workers every day uh, and remind and, and, and kind of get them going in the right direction, He'll have to remind me every once in a while that, hey, these are humans. You can't just optimize the hell out of the system. It's not a system. It's, it's, it's a set of employees that you have working for you. And so to really understand these humans, one place to go is where the humans hang out. Specifically for Mechanical Turk, there's a place called Turker Nation. 
Uh, this is a place, it's essentially a message board, where Turkers go to share information on tasks and on requesters. And this is a really good place to go to be reminded that this is all about humanity and humans. Uh, when, I was, when I was in grad school, toward the end of my PhD, I was essentially doing research on Mechanical Turk, and I'd run experiments. I'd send off a set of a thousand tasks, get them, pause for the day, analyze the data, and then start the next day. And I'd like to believe that the Turkers were looking out for my, for my well-being, but I'm not actually sure of what they were going for when, they, when one of the Turkers made this observation. But I think this actually summarizes the life of a grad student pretty well. So they said that Adam Marcus has an unusual schedule. It's pretty cute. I, I appreciated it. Um, luckily, I get a little bit more sleep now. But uh, that's, that's sort of a cute observation that a human would make. It doesn't always work out in your favor that someone cares a lot about you. So one of the things that Turkers really care about is that if they see a new task and there's a ton of money available and a ton of work available, that the requester that's asking for the work is trustworthy and is going to pay them and is going to, to actually give them good work. And so what a worker had started a thread on, on, mechanical, uh, on Turker Nation that asked essentially, hey, this Adam Marcus guy, should I be trusting him? And very nice, another worker said, hey, I don't think you need to worry. He, that's me, is great on communication, responds to messages, and makes changes to all the hits as per our feedback, which made me feel really great. But these hits that I was running was a set of experiments. So one of the experiments that, that my friend Eugene in the back and I had to, uh, had to, had to run was to determine how much work we could have a worker do in exchange for a certain amount of money. And in order to do that, we had to change the amount of work that was available for a fixed amount of money. And so a few days later, the person who made this observation posted another message. Basically, they, they labeled me yet another requester that's reducing the pay drastically. And so when you think about the system that you're building and optimizing, Think about the limits of the optimizations that you're, that you're building, because in the end, there's humans that are observing exactly what you're doing. I mentioned one thing I learned about weekends and crowdsourcing at Loku, but there's a number of other interesting things that I learned. Uh, a lot of them are along the lines of <coughs> sources of decreased throughput in data processing systems that you're building. So this one's kind of sad. Uh, a, a, about a year ago now, there was significant flooding in the Philippines. And as a result, a significant portion of our workers couldn't come to work for a few days. So all of a sudden, Loku was processing less data. There's also a happier version of this. They didn't invite us to celebrate with them, but there was a national holiday in Pakistan. And similarly, there was just a Monday where nothing was being processed, at least in Pakistan. So luckily, we had all the other countries that we were in. But this is the kind of stuff that you need to start planning for, being alerted about. Now we have calendars for all of the countries that we're in, just to make sure that we know to expect these kinds of things. And so a really simple way to think about this is that humans can get you a lot of really interesting data processed on your behalf, but essentially they're going to get you 95, 99, 99.9% .9 if you're really lucky, right? You can find the best crowd workers who do really good work. You can have the best algorithms make sure that they did a good job on the specific question that you asked them. And you're still not going to get to 100% data quality or correctness or whatever it is. And this actually goes beyond crowdsourcing. It applies to machine learning as well. Any time that you're relying on statistics or some kind of system that might have some faults in it, you're not going to get to 100%. And this is something that we've also had to deal with at Loku. It's even, even in our wildest dreams, we're still going to have to live with a world where if we're lucky, one out of a million menus is going to have an issue with it. And Yes, the crowd enables us to process data faster than any of our competitors. It allows us to process data with higher quality than any of our competitors. But we're relying on a crowd, which is full of humans, and every once in a while they make mistakes. The other part goes back to the fact that this is remote labor. You have to compensate for the awkward environment that you've set up for yourself. So it's not like your coworkers that can come up to you, tap you on the shoulder, and say, hey, I didn't really understand what it was that you were saying. Can you clarify this for me? Can you work through this example with me? These are folks that are awake at a different time of day than you and in a different part of the world than you. 
So you have to be able to compensate for these kinds of things. So one thing that matters a lot is instructions, right? It's really common to see a, a page worth of instructions telling a worker just how to do a really simple small micro task. And it's important, you, you might think it's silly to have that wall of text, but the card workers actually appreciate it because they're going to read through it and then do a few hundred, a hundred tasks for you. And they're willing to read through it so that they can get to the right answer. Matt, who is one of the guys who kind of does a lot of work directly with the crowd workers, he writes a lot of these manuals and instructions and quizzes for the workers and he'll send it over to them and say, hey, what do you think? What else can I add to this to make it better? The workers generally come back to him and they say, hey, send us more examples. Examples matter a lot. So you want to have as large a bank of example problems worked out for the crowd workers so that they can kind of match the problem that they're looking at to an existing solution and solve it in a similar way. I talked to you a little about this, about how we can incentivize high quality. Incentives matter a whole lot. You've got a different set of people in a different part of the world with a different set of incentives and motivations than you. And so you need to make sure that you're rewarding them uh, in a way that makes your incentives align as much as possible. And you know, I mentioned one case where algorithms can help here. So this, this regression that our intern Daniel is working on is doing an amazing job of telling us when a task is likely to be uh, highly corrected by a reviewer. And so that algorithm is helping us zero in on what workers and what work need the most attention. And we're getting very close to the closing now. So I want to change the topic very slightly, but in a very important way. So everything I've told you about so far is about how to design with the requester in mind. So you are the person standing there with a stack of dollar bills, and you are thinking about how to spend that money most wisely. And I've told you about a number of tricks, algorithms, techniques, to spend your money wisely with the crowd. But the thing that people spend very little time thinking about is how to design for the people on the other side of that, for the crowd. And so I think if you really want to make an impact, then think about how to make crowd workers' lives easier. There's, I think, very few examples of people that have thought about this. One really awesome example is a system called Turgopticon, and it's actually a pretty simple one. It's a browser-based extension that provides workers with the same kind of information that requesters want to know. So you're a crowd worker, you're on Mechanical Turk, and you've looked through all the tasks that are available for you, and this browser plugin lets you look at information that other Turkers have left for you about this requester. How communicative they are, how generous they are, how fair they are, how prompt they are at replying to your questions. This is the kind of stuff that we should be building to make our crowd workers more effective so that when we go to the crowd, we know that we can trust them and they can trust us. And so leave this with this question of what a crowd empowering system would look like. And since I've talked a whole lot, it's probably helpful to try to summarize everything that I've talked about in a final thought. And essentially, if you only walk away with one thing, it's that the best thing that you can do for your crowdsourced workflow is to identify a set of competent workers and then continually train and incentivize them. That's basically all you have to think about as you're building your crowdsourced workflow, and you'll do an awesome job of it. So thanks a bunch to the awesome folks at Lopu that make all of this possible, the awesome folks at Dogpath, specifically Abby and Sid, who kind of put all this together. And I did a lot of talking, but actually I didn't do all the coding or the development. Uh, a lot of our crowdsourcing efforts existed before I showed up at Lopu. Uh, and the, there are many folks today, like Matt and Kynar, that make the system possible. Daniel, who's our awesome intern that's been building a lot of these algorithms. And then Arsene and Maxime, who have spent a lot of time working on various user interfaces for our workers, as well as building out some of our Crowdflower instrumentation. And so with that, I talked to you about these two different crowdsourcing uh, methodologies and reminded you that there's humans inside, so keep that in mind. Thanks a bunch, and I'm totally happy to answer any of your questions. Yes. I'm surprised that you moved to human reviewers immediately. Did you consider using an automated review where you give out known problems and you can tell 
because you know what the answers are, what mistakes are being made, yes. and do a quick feedback loop on training people. So this is really common in the world of micro tasks. It's, it's called, it, it's, it's, a, it's absolutely a great model, and it's called gold standard data sets. So essentially, just like you can either redundantly ask workers questions, or just like you can have someone review tasks, you can also throw in a question every once in a while that you know the answer to, to make sure that the worker is doing a good job. It turns out that if you're having workers do so much work for you, and the type of work changes subtly as you go along, that gold standard data sets are really good when you're doing some short-term project. Because there, you're not going to get enough experience with a set of workers in order to uh, know which ones are doing the best job. And so you want to make sure that they at least answer your gold standard data well. For longer term work, you essentially just need to know who's doing a great job. And the only way to do that is either have a human being who you trust say, yeah, they do a good job a lot of the time, or to ask multiple workers the same question and just make sure that someone isn't just throwing out answers. Yeah. Uh, to what extent is language a problem if you're sort of recruiting from all over the world? It's not just language, it's culture. So for us, a lot of what we're doing is requires an understanding of English and increasingly we're moving into other countries so an understanding of other languages um, but a lot of it can be done through pattern matching right so essentially I need to make sure that this set of words that I recognize but I might not be fluent in uh, appears in the right order in the right place with the right syntax in structured form and so you end up with these really interesting scenarios where reviewers are excellent at catching errors, but they're not excellent at communicating them to someone else. So it's often that the messages that a reviewer might type to an entry-level worker aren't as good as what a manager would or what we would. And so a lot of what we do is set up template ways to classify errors that workers make so that a reviewer who might be good at catching an error but not that great at describing it can still communicate with an entry-level worker. There's a bunch of other tricks that you can play to make sure that people are uh, looking at work that uh, that someone else did and they can speak in a language that, that both of them are familiar with. Um, and so in general, language is definitely something that you have to design around, but you can generally design it. You can, you can figure out sort of the 95% solution with smart user interface design. The other thing is culture. So we had this really awesome example. So in, in, in our, a lot of the workers that we have were in Pakistan. They were processing these menus, but they didn't really understand what this type of food was that they were processing. And so one, one of them, an agency leader that was kind of organizing a bunch of crowd workers, took them out for a pizza party. And so they all went out, they ate pizza, and now they knew what it was that they were even typing about. Um, <laughs> there's lots of interesting things that you'll notice. In, so they sent us pictures of this, which is really cool. One thing you'll notice is that there's two rooms of crowd workers. One of them that's having pizza is a bunch of males, and another room contains a bunch of females. And this is just how things work in Pakistan. It's definitely not the case that, that Logu can say, hey, we're in America, we're going to impose our culture on you. But it's definitely an interesting observation that you can make once you kind of see how the crowd workers are doing what they do. Yeah? Are there uh, any types of tasks that you found you just couldn't get to work well with crowdsourcing? Um, so I haven't yet. Uh, I think the place where you start to, to fail is in expert sourcing, right? So if what you're looking for is someone who has really domain-specific knowledge on a particular topic, in general, uh, to be honest, on Odesk, you'll find them. But you won't be able to build automated systems that, that, ha that help you find them at scale. So it requires a lot more, more work to bootstrap it on your end. Uh, but people have done some pretty creative stuff with the help of the crowd. So one of my colleagues at MIT, Michael Bernstein, built a system called Soylent that essentially embedded a a, uh, an editor, like an editor that you'd go out to pay to read your paper and correct it, on top of Mechanical Turk. So essentially he's, he designed a workflow where one set of workers identifies mistakes, another set of workers 
proposes some fixes to the mistakes, and then another set of workers votes on them, so that everyone's interests are sort of separated and aligned. Um, and that's a workflow that's called find, fix, verify that he designed. And he ends up, for slightly less than the cost of a professional editor, getting uh, editing quality at about the same level without having to go out and find the editor. You can do it from the comfort of your home, embedded inside Microsoft Word. That's pretty awesome. The other cool thing about using the crowd for doing something like this is that uh, the crowd doesn't get quite as tired because you can have a different set of people look at different segments of the paper. And so they actually, uh, on, on the Soylent paper that they were writing, they had the crowd edit it, and the crowd was able to find a mistake that uh, there were a ton of people on that paper. But essentially, I think it was like five or six people who either had PhDs or were working on getting their PhDs kept going over and missing mistakes in. And so you end up with some pretty interesting and useful side effects. Yeah. I mentioned in the beginning that you were using some classifiers to discover uh, menus uh, and, and some templating to break them down. One, I guess it's a two-parter, what percentage uh, are you able to successfully break down before you have to get to the step? Two, did you find any success with doing like two types of specific classifiers to successfully identify like Italian? Yep. So the thing I can't tell you is specific numbers, just ah. like I can't tell you how many tasks per day we're processing. The thing I can tell you is that we have kind of type-specific classifiers and that we have media-specific classifiers. Flash animation, you treat and decompile and extract the information from very differently than you would a PDF that needs to be OCR, very differently than you would a PDF that has text embedded inside of it, very differently from an HTML table. And so the classifiers that we have absolutely look for the specific type of information that they're designed for nail salon different from a pizzeria. Um, and they absolutely perform better on certain domains and on certain types of data than they do on others. And so the crowd workers generally don't have this problem. Uh, and so we, we apply them to certain parts of the data set a lot more heavily than others. Very cool. Just kind of following up on his question. So you haven't found tasks that they can't do, but I guess how far have you pushed it as far as the task complexity? Yeah. Like, is it mostly yes or no type things, or could you do more open-ended type? Yeah, so, so I can tell you the types of creative things that I've seen in the world. Um, the one person, I think Bjorn Hartman of Berkeley, had crowd workers write a book, a picture book. Um, so that's a super creative task. I think Eugene, at some point, was trying to have the crowd draw things on his behalf. And I think you ran into some difficulty there, right? Like, basically, you can have crowd workers, correct me if I'm wrong, Eugene, but you can have crowd workers draw creative things for you, but if you're, have, if you're having them coordinate and having them draw parts of an entire larger image, then they're not going to coordinate very well with each other at the boundary. And so, in general, tasks that decompose really well, you can actually have them do pretty creative things with. But tasks that require a lot of coordination of that creativity tend to break down. Questions? Uh, do you also use ODESC uh, quite extensively? And if so, then uh, what are some of the things that you keep in mind while choosing a talented artist or a web developer? So we haven't used ODESC too much do a lot of development for, for Lofu, so for the most part, we, we keep that in-house. One, one awesome case where we did use some Oduskers that were pretty talented developers, and I consider working with them again, is when we wanted to, we, we kind of were on a deadline, we were uh, hosting a hackathon, and we wanted to make available to anyone that came into our hackathon an implementation of the Loku API. By the way, go to dev.loku.com if you want to work with any of our data. It's available for you to build awesome applications with. Um, we wanted to have an implementation of the Loku API in a bunch of different programming languages, some of which we're not experts in, and some of which we just didn't have the time to implement. So we went on Odesk, we hired a bunch of people who were experts in those languages, and we said, hey, can you implement the Loku API in your language? That worked out really well. Um, 
again, talk to Eugene about outsourcing some creative stuff on, on Odesk. We, we were hosting a conference uh, at MIT, New England Database Day, and we had folks build a logo for us. Um, and that seemed to work out pretty well. It's the logo we used, so we replaced the old one. Um, but that, I hope that gives you a sense of kind of the more technical and creative side of Odesk. Other question? Yeah, so as as this crowdsourcing is going on, as the individuals are answering these questions, your your algorithm is getting smarter and smarter based on what people are doing. That's right. Um, so is do, do you see the the crowdsourcing that you're doing uh, you know, on a you know, constant reduction as the algorithm gets smarter? And is, is there a limit to that where it doesn't make sense to invest in technology more because it's just so efficient? So, so yeah, so basically what, one thing that you've subtly, subtly identified is that when workers do work, they're essentially correcting mistakes that our algorithm made, and so we feed that back into the system. And so our system's constantly getting smarter and smarter and doing a better job of extracting content from more diverse uh, sources. Uh, it is the case that this makes the tasks cheaper for us because workers have to do less work in order to get them to high data quality, it's not, th this is a statement of opinion. Uh, I, I don't think we'll ever ditch the crowd. Um, I, I think that there are enough interesting ways in which people can generate diverse structured content on the web that's embedded in really weird scenarios that the algorithm's going to fail every once in a while. It might be the case that one day Loku solves the AI problem. We've built artificial intelligence, but un until then, I think we're, we're going to have crowd workers involved to some extent. It's, but it is getting cheaper and cheaper as we go. Yeah. Uh, two things, I guess. One, would you say there's a sort of a minimum scale for the number of tasks it makes sense to use this system for? And then uh, also, can you talk at all? I don't know if you are able to, but about maybe like the percentage savings you'd have over if you hired a real person sitting there. Yeah, so, okay. Let's start with, sorry, so I remember the second question. And not the first the first was, is there like a minimum scale yeah. where you wouldn't bother with this? So, so I think the scale thing works like this. To be honest, most of the things I've done, even in grad school research, which is significantly smaller scale than this, I think in the end, there are certain things that you personally just don't want to crunch through on your own. And so the scale question is actually more of how much do you want to do yourself or how much can you, like, can you buy a pizza and have your friends help you with it and then you're done with it? Um, then you probably don't want to crowdsource it. Uh, in general, because of the way these, these crowd workers end up attacking problems, you end up with something like a Ziffian distribution of work being done on a task, meaning there's a ton, uh, there's a really small of workers that do a significant amount of work for you. They just crank through the tasks, and there's a long tail of workers that don't quite uh, do all that much work for you. And so, in the end, you can benefit from crowdsourcing even on smaller data sets, because you only have to look after the quality of the folks that did the, the most work and potentially the most damage to, to your work. And so if you're looking at anything more than a few hundred rows in an Excel spreadsheet that you want to do something to, it's probably faster to throw it on Mechanical Turk and, and have workers take a stab at it than it would be for you to do it yourself. Um, <coughs> the second question, now I'm forgetting. Uh, is, uh, could, can you speak at all to the maybe difference in cost this, uh, of this system versus actually hiring something? So it's two things. Uh, one, it's uh, a fixed cost to hire people. So at the scale that Loku is growing, we have several hundred crowd workers. As we've had different partnerships that we need to scale up for or scale down for, we've been able to change that very easily. And I don't quite know how to put a monetary value on that. We didn't have to go build a building somewhere in the world where we could house anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand workers. Right? Um, it is the case that when you, have, when you have workers do work for you in other parts of the world, then the living wage is a lot lower. And so if we were to hire people in the United States to do it, it would cost a lot more, assuming that we were being fair to them. Uh, and 
the last part is it's not just about the, the amount of money that you pay, but it's also finding people that would be willing to do the work. So I, Matt, Kynar, and I, we, we crank through some of these tasks, and it's, it's the kind of thing that like, I sort of start going crazy after a while trying to do, uh, but, but the crowd workers, some of them have done thousands of tasks for us. And so I think it's not just a question of what the, what the cost is, it's also a question of whether you or someone that, that's culturally similar to you or trained to appreciate certain things or not appreciate certain things would even be willing to sit down and just do this day in and day out. Have you seen any crowdfunding? where they really get bored after a certain point of time, and at what time was the time that happens? Yeah, so, so you'll notice in, that, in the reviewer hierarchy workflow, we're reviewing the reviewers as well. And this is because uh, some reviewers end up either being distracted, or they end up you know, getting bored after a while and not participating in the system in quite the same degree that they were before, and we want to make sure that we catch that so data quality stays high. Um, the, in general, I, I wouldn't call it a trend. It's essentially we need we need to notice when a worker starts doing less good work, but it's not the case that every worker will eventually do this. We've had workers that have been with us since day one, and they're kind of our rock stars. So it's I I'm I haven't looked at the data deeply enough to say that that there's some systematic trend in it. Uh, but I my my guess would be that there is. process for recruiting the, the workers initially like did you put a project up on Odesk and said hey we're looking for people to do data entry or like how, how did you recruit the top people? That's right yeah so essentially we started off by doing that um, once you have a good set of trusted workers you can also ask them if they have any friends so essentially snowball sampling start getting folks that know folks to do a good job um, and and essentially, then it starts growing organically. At this point, a lot of the interest, like uh, actually, at this point, all of the hiring that we do is by inbound interest. Essentially, we become known as a company that pays fairly, that has reasonable tasks that people want to do, um, and so people are coming to us and asking for work through their network. Um, but we started off essentially, as you said, by posting a project to Odesk. I don't really have any good advice there on how to bootstrap it. Mostly, like, manage it yourself. As in, it, it's not the case that you can just kind of hire people and have them do the right thing. You, at the beginning, for the bootstrapping phase, you kind of just need to be there looking at how people misunderstand things, make mistakes, don't do a good job, and kind of help them improve as they go. Sure. So, you talked a little bit about you know, the fact that, that there's cost differential between operating uh, or having workers that are based in, in other parts of the world, potentially, and in the United States uh, on an individualized basis. There's also this whole uh, either sort of managerial overhead. I mean, obviously, you, you uh, refer to your hierarchical model and having reviewers and managers, but you don't end up with six layers of executives between someone at the top of that 500-person that chain um, and your workers. Um, I guess, do you, well, do you have a, I mean, is there more structure that has to come into place because of, uh, in order to have like human resources or anything of that sort? How does that end up feeding into your equation? So the nice, so I, I think one of the ways in which traditional organizations end up needing to scale out things like HR and things like that are because the people who started a company aren't experts in payroll, in HR laws, and all of these things. And one of the really nice things about any of these marketplaces is that they figured that out for you. So people talk about disintermediating Odesk, which is essentially saying like, hey, once I've established relationships with people on Odesk, why don't I just offer to pay them directly? and ditch the, the, the middle person, right? Say, hey, I'm not going to pay Odesk's whatever it is, 10% fee. But it turns out that then you start researching how to get a dollar bill from here to Pakistan and from here to the Philippines and figuring out how to do taxes in each of these countries. And it turns out that the overhead of that 
is if you're super efficient and you hire these professionals and lawyers and payroll people, it's, a, it's pushing on somewhere between 6 and 7%. So now you're saying, well, I'm paying Odesk something like 3% to do this. And so the way in which we scale is to rely on the marketplace to handle a lot of this for us. And at that point, the system is essentially self-scaling. If we notice that we need to give more advice to the crowd workers, well, we just increase the amount of reviewers. If we notice that we need to give more cross-cutting advice to workers, then we promote a few reviewers into manager positions. And so, for the most part, I don't see the hierarchy changing in some significant way or needing more people at the top. But I do think that given that crowdsourcing is a really young field, we're going to see other organizations come in, and I think many of them for, for good reason, saying, hey, maybe maybe at a certain scale, you need to have someone inside your company that understands international labor law or understands international payroll. And at that point, you know, Loku, like every company, I think will, will do the thing that makes the most sense, which is to listen to people who have thought really hard about this. So I think there are places where we might grow, but I, I don't see the need to scale up an HR organization around crowdsourcing quite as, being quite as necessary, given that there are smart folks at places like Amazon and Odesk that kind of figure this out for us. Yeah. Uh, so for the scaling, I guess, what about kind of the investment you have to make in your own IT infrastructure? So did you have to put an engineer, I mean, it sounds like your system's gotten a lot more complex and elaborate than you started, so did you have to put an engineer or a team of engineers on this building yet, or? Yeah, so the, so, so maybe that's a great question, right? So maybe that's a good answer to, to Matt's question, right? The, you end up needing to scale out the people who figure out your incentive systems and the people who end up engineering those incentive systems for the workers. And so we've got a few awesome people, I've, I've named some of them, but you know the, the main person who spends all of his time building things for the workers, and he's always building things for the workers, is Kynark. Uh, and he essentially spends his time, you know, we, we have some meetings, Matt says, you know, the workers need help in the following way, or the workers are making mistakes in the following way. And we either, either have to design a set of automated data quality tests that make sure that we catch certain mistakes and correct them if we can, or catch mistakes and alert the workers that potentially they've made the mistakes, or set up a whole new incentive mechanism to get workers to avoid making these kinds of mistakes in the future. And so the investment is there. And I think Loku is a super young company. I, I, I don't want to pretend to tell the future. My gut says, just like we're probably not going to solve the AI problem, we're probably always going to be, as we move into new verticals, as we move into, into a bunch of, like serving a bunch of local merchants, as we move into new countries that we're processing data, this is what we're doing today, we're going to need more help on the engineering side, and so that might be where we need to kind of scale up internally. I think I bought way too much pizza and drinks, so 